Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. It's an absolute thrill to be here tonight. And um, I'm very, very excited that so many people have turned out to hear about my adventure making sake in Japan. First, I want to thank uh, the Japan Society, especially the Talks Plus program, for arranging the talk tonight. I also want to thank Hakai San Sake Brewery for inviting me to live and apprentice at their facility. And I want to thank all of you for coming out on a rainy, cold night to learn a little bit more about sake. I hope we have a lot of fun tonight. Uh, just a, a few quick words about um, the run of the show for this evening. I'm going to speak for about 40 minutes and show you some slides from uh, my experience in Japan. I'm going to break the lecture up by the seasons. Uh, so we're going to have spring, summer, etc. And I'm going to show you some work in the brewery from each season. And I'm also going to show you uh, some of the cultural events that I took part in while I was in Japan. Um, one question I get uh, more than any other is, how did you get started in this? How did you get involved with sake? And we have to go back to ancient times to uh, talk about that. I first discovered sake back in 2005. My initial exposure to Japan was not anime or manga or anything like that. I actually went out for a sushi dinner back in 2005. And on a whim, I decided to order uh, premium sake. And this picture that you see here was actually taken with my two megapixel Palm Pilot back in 2005. <laughs> and um, I was at a restaurant that was very good sushi, but not a very casual place. And they had the sake menu up on the wall. And I looked at all the offerings, and the one on the far left said clean and dry, $13 a glass. And I said, I'm going to try that. So I ordered the sake, I got my sushi, and when I tried the two together, that moment kind of changed my life forever. It was so delicious. I remember saying to myself, why didn't I know this was out there? I'd been eating sushi for a long time, but I'd never had the premium sake. When I had them together, I immediately had to learn more. So the first thing I did was I went home and I looked online and I didn't find a lot of information about sake. So what I decided to do in 2005, uh, about six months after this, I started a website called urbansake.com. And uh, I wanted to, it started out as my personal blog. I wanted to record my adventures and my misadventures uh, learning about sake in New York City. I've kept up this website for the last 13 years, and it is now an educational website where I have over 900 sakes listed in my database, and I have a shopping guide for people who are interested in finding restaurants and retail stores that support a good sake program. And I also have an events calendar as well. So please check it out if you're interested in learning more about sake. I was blogging for about two years, and then in 2007, I had the honor of becoming a sake samurai. This is an award given out by the Japan Sake Brewers Association. And this picture is the day I received the award back in 2007. This is also my very first day in Japan ever. I had never been to Japan before. And um, needless to say, to arrive in Japan in Kyoto and be invited up to the platform in a thousand-year-old UNESCO World Heritage Shrine was a great introduction to visiting Japan. Um, when you become a sake samurai, they make you swear to different vows, and you actually have to take an oath. And one of the vows that you swear to is to promote sake with pride and passion around the world. And this experience, the Shinto ceremony was actually very moving and really changed the direction of my life in a lot of ways. When I got back from Japan, I started immediately getting into teaching, and here I am at the Sake School of America, and for many years I would work at my corporate job during the day, and in evenings and weekends I would do sake seminars and lectures as much as I could. In 2010, I left corporate America behind and began working full-time in the sake industry, and in 2014, Hakai-san invited me to be their brand ambassador. Uh, this is the president of Hakai-san, Mr. Nagumo. And uh, from that point on, I worked with um, Hakai-san to promote their brand around the world. I got to travel to many places. I got to go to Dubai and Australia and Milan and Brazil. And it was a wonderful, wonderful uh, experience. But I had a nagging feeling in the back of my mind that I needed to do something else. I wanted to take my teaching to the next level. And I got into my mind that I wanted to actually work at a brewery for a year. Now, why did I want to do that? There's a few reasons why I wanted to move to Japan. The first, of course, was to become a better teacher. 
I wanted to improve my knowledge of the intricacies of sake brewing. That was kind of a no-brainer. Of course, I also wanted to improve my Japanese language skills. Um, but probably most important of all, I wanted to get to know the people behind the bottle. Sake is more than just a liquid in a bottle. The brewers, the kurabito that make the sake, and their culture that they create at the brewery really, for me, gives sake meaning. And I always call Japanese sake, I call it Japanese culture in a cup. For me, it's a real uh, uh, distillation of the best parts of Japanese culture in a beverage. So uh, that was really important to me. I wanted to get to know the people behind the brand that I was representing. And of course, I wanted to navigate the local culture customs and of course, eat the food. Um, that's one thing I was really looking forward to. So uh, with the help of Hakai-san, I applied for a visa and um, I received what's known as a cultural activities visa to study sake making. I didn't realize it at the time, but this, this type of visa is given out to people who study the martial arts in Japan, or if they study ikebana, flower arranging, or Japanese calligraphy. I found out, um, uh, and here's the visa that I got, I found out after the year was over that I was the first person ever to receive a cultural activities visa to study the art of sake making. So that was a really uh, surprising thing I didn't realize, and I hope that I'm the first of many more to, to study uh, sake in Japan. A little bit about the brewery I went to. So I went to Hakai-san Sake Brewery. Um, it's located in Niigata, Japan, which you see here in pink. The star represents Tokyo, and it's about 90 minutes by bullet train from Tokyo one way. The name Hakai-san means eight peaked mountain. So uh, this is Hakai-san Mountain, and our brewery is literally in the shadow of this mountain. And um, there are eight peaks at the top, and they're a little hard to see, so I called them out for you right there. Um, not, only is you, not only can you see this mountain from the brewery itself, but more importantly, our water, our water source, comes from the foothills of this mountain. So um, it, we are constantly uh, in view of this mountain and our brand is named after this mountain. Um, here you see on the left, you see the water source of Hakai-san. This is Raiden-sama no Mizu and this is a snow melt mountain spring water. It's some of the softest water in Japan. In the upper right, you see a snow scene. Uh, this area of Niigata is exceedingly famous for the very heavy snowfall that it receives. And in the bottom right, you get a little preview of what we'll be tasting tonight. We have three sakes that we're gonna be previewing. And I'll tell you a little bit more about those sakes at the end of the lecture. So we're gonna start with autumn for my internship. And I made my way to Japan actually on October 1st. And does anyone know what October 1st is? It's sake day, that's right. So I actually, by chance, I started my internship on International Sake Day. And this was my first view of Hakai-san Mountain. This is actually taken from the bullet train as I pulled into the station. Um, I arrived and they put me right to work. Uh, I started working at the rice milling facility. This is where sake production starts. So logically, they had me start here. And this is a scene from inside the rice milling facility where you can see all the rice stacked up. And um, the job of this facility is to polish and mill the rice. So we wanna mill the rice. Why do they do that? Well, sake rice is different from eating rice. The primary difference with sake rice is that the starch is concentrated in the core of the grain. The outer layers of sake rice contain the fats and the proteins and the vitamins. And those things we, we actually want to polish away and isolate that starch in the center. Here you can see some sake rice close up and you see that little opaque area in the middle? That is the starchy core. Uh, they call that shinpaku or the white heart of the, of the grain in Japanese. The way this machine works is that the rice is put into the hopper and using gravity it's dropped over a spinning milling stone a little bit of the rice grain is scraped away and then um, the powder is shaken off and then it goes back up to the top and around and around it goes. It takes about 48 hours to mill a grain of rice from 100% down to 50% remaining. One of the jobs that I had to do was here. This is the pipe coming off the machine that offloads the uh, finished milled sake rice. And you can see I have a bag there and I push a foot pedal 
and 30 kilograms of rice come out, and I have to catch it in this reusable bag and zip it shut, and then I have to stack it five bags high on this pallet. And when the first day I did this, they said, okay, the bags are 30 kilograms. The bags are 30 kilograms. And I'm like, okay, no problem. I had no idea how heavy 30 kilograms was. <laughs> and I decided to wait until the end of the day to look it up on my phone, and it actually turns out to be about 66 pounds. <laughs> I don't know if I would have made it through my internship if I'd looked that up before, but I actually, I actually made it through, and we would do a couple pallets uh, in the morning, some in the afternoon, and um, this was the introduction to my internship, and I knew it would be a very physical experience, as I expected. Uh, the last point about rice milling was this slide here. On my first week at the brewery, the manager of the milling facility, Mr. Jun Nagamo, took me aside and asked me to look through a little microscope, and he had prepared two samples of rice for me. Both of these rice samples were milled at the exact same time in the same batch. The sample on the left was allowed to chill at room temperature. So when rice comes out of the milling machine, it's quite warm from the friction. So they let one sample of this rice cool at room temperature. The other sample on the right was put in a little tray and was put in the refrigerator, and it was cooled very rapidly. And as you can see, the rice on the right that was chilled in the refrigerator, almost universally, everything cracked right in half. And the rice on the left that was allowed to cool normally uh, stayed intact. When you mill the outer layer away, the rice loses some of its structure, and the inside, the starchy part, is very fragile. So I learned this in my first week, and this is something that, as a sake teacher, I didn't know for many years, and uh, I knew from that moment on that this internship was going to be teaching me the type of things that I wanted to know. So for autumn in the culture, one of the first things I noticed, one day I came to work, and I saw these workers putting up uh, these structures around the trees and the plants at the brewery. And I learned that this was yuki gakoi. This was a, a reinforcement to keep the trees from collapsing under the weight of the coming snow. So as you can imagine, I was a little bit nervous seeing this. I didn't know how much snow was going to be awaiting me. Um, the final activity I'm going to talk about for the fall is a uh, matsuri, or a festival, that the company took me to. It's called the Hakaisan Mountain Shrine Hiwatari Festival. And they told me it was a fire festival. And I'm like, oh, that sounds cool. So I went along, and there was this uh, fire uh, pyre set up on a sand uh, platform. And then they had a beautiful procession and a little bit of a Shinto ceremony. Then they lit the pyre on fire. It started to smoke. And then it really started to burn. And I saw people taking off their shoes. And then I realized, after talking a little bit more, that this was a fire walking festival. And the heat was so intense that people were literally backing away from this bonfire. And I'm like, there is no way I'm doing this. <laughs> but they kind of like took me by the hand and helped me get my shoes off and put me in line. And I saw little five-year-old kids doing it. I saw you know, uh, elderly ladies doing it. So I, I had to do it. So. Um, this is the lineup of people waiting to cross the coals. Um, in the middle there is uh, the, one of the managers at Hakaisan, and there you go, there I am. Now, the reason that people do this crazy thing, apparently it gives you one year of health for your body if you go through this uh, fire walking festival. And I have to tell you, for an entire year of lifting bags of rice and stirring vats of sake, I was not sick one single day. I did come back after Japan, and I did throw my back out uh, napping on a couch over Christmas. So I have to say that I really believe this definitely works. Uh, moving on to winter. So I had seen so many people talking about the snow is coming, the snow is coming. It's like Game of Thrones, the winter is coming. And uh, so much preparation had been done to prepare for the vast amounts of snowfall. I was, every day I was waiting for the snow to come, and finally around December 11th, I woke up and the snow was falling and I ran outside, and <laughs> you can see how happy I was. I had to take a, a snow selfie because I was so excited. Just to give you a few snapshots, this is uh, the Hachikura, which is a Hakaisan gift shop and a little library at the brewery. This is uh, one of the uh, mid-December, and by the end of December, we were looking like this. 
Uh, and this is the Yukigakoi. So these are the same trees that I just showed you a moment ago covered with snow. And this isn't just a fluffy snow. This is very wet, heavy snow. So they really need that reinforcement. The other thing that was really fun was this. Um, I had never seen this before. This is called Shosetsu pipe. And this is common in Niigata and a little bit in Yamagata, I heard. Uh, this is a concrete channel that runs down the middle of the roads. And when snow is detected, every three feet or so, there's a little sprinkler and it gives off a little, uh, uh, a little fountain, and the water runs over the street and melts the snow as it falls. And because this water is constantly moving, it doesn't freeze. So this is a very, very ingenious way to deal with the vast amounts of snow. And um, the place I was staying at Hakaisan is very rural, so I did have to drive many places, and I can tell you the streets that were treated with the Shosetsu pipe were very easy to drive on versus the ones that were not. I wanted to show you uh, some photos of my internship and just walk you through the sake production process. The winter season that we're in now is really the most concentrated time of work at the sake brewery. Um, after milling, the first step is rice washing. And for everyone, this is your first look at my uniform that I'm going to be wearing in all of these photos. Um, we're definitely covered up. And uh, uh, rice washing is an integral step to sake brewing. After the milling, there's still powder on the rice. We need to wash that off, and we need to introduce moisture into the grain. After this, the rice is soaked, and then we move on to rice steaming. So here I am receiving rice from the steaming vat. Uh, my coworker there is using a wooden spade uh, like this, which is a flat wooden spade that they use to shovel the rice out from the steamer. And I actually was given this job on one of my first days at the brewery. And this, these spades are, are flat on the top. If you're familiar with like American snow shovels, they have a curved sides when you scoop. But this one was completely flat. And I scooped my first scoop of rice and moved it. And the rice went flying off <laughs> the shovel to the left and landed right on the floor. And um, the, the assistant master brewer was standing right next to me. And I didn't really hear a complaint. I just kind of heard like a, a grumble. <laughs> and that was one of my last days doing the rice scooping. Um, if, I'd want, if I'd wanted to get out of that task, I, it was a very smart move. Uh, but um, these shovels were very tricky for me. After the rice steaming, we move on to cooling. And they have a very unique process for doing this. They put some rice on a piece of fabric, and then two brewers throw the rice back and forth to agitate and to cool the rice down. After the rice is cooled, we move on to making koji. Koji is a type of molded rice that is integral to the sake making. It's a rice that converts starch into sugar. And here I am in the koji room. It's about 100 degrees Fahrenheit. They make an environment that the koji loves. The mold absolutely loves it, and all the, the brewery workers hate it. But it is uh, very, very hot. And for 48 hours, they grow this mold on the rice. And again, that mold is going to give a, an enzyme that converts starch into sugar. So that's how we get sugar out of rice to make alcohol. After the koji is made, we have all the ingredients we need to start fermentation. The first step is what's called the fermentation starter. In a small tank, we put in water, we put in regular steamed rice, we put in this uh, molded koji rice. And right at the beginning on the first day, we add all the yeast at once. And this small batch of sake brews for about two weeks and creates a very, very vibrant yeast colony. After the fermentation starter is done in two weeks, we move on to the main fermentation tank. This is an open tank fermentation. We put the yeast starter in there, along with uh, more water, more regular steamed rice, and more koji rice. And uh, this ferments for about 30 days. What I'm doing here, uh, Mr. Takano behind me is stirring the tank. And my job on this day was to wipe the tank down. Um, little splashes of the fermentation mash will get on the mouth of the tank when you're stirring. And if you leave it there, it, the yeast will die and give off flavors or off aromas into the sake. So we have to meticulously wipe the tank and the floor every day um, that we're fermenting. After fermentation, we move to the sake press. This is a Yabuta-style automatic sake press. And uh, the mash goes into these frames. Uh, pressure is applied from the side. And then what's left over, you see here, is called sake kasu. 
This is the unfermented rice solids that come out in cakes. And if you have any bit of OCD in your personality, this is a wonderful task to do because it's very, very satisfying to peel these cakes off and get every little bit out of there. So uh, this is actually something that I really enjoyed. Um, the final picture I'm going to show you is this. Uh, this is uh, the entrance to an upstairs part of the sake brewery. And I was coming back from lunch one time at the uh, end of February. And somebody asked me, oh, is Mr. So-and-so up in the brewery? And I walked over and I looked at all the boots and I knew immediately that he was up there because I saw his boots. And I'm like, hey, I can recognize people by their boots. And this is really the first moment that I felt like I was a member of the team and a real brewery worker. So this, this photo is really uh, meaningful for me. Now let's move on to spring. Um, what do you think of when you think of spring? A lot of people think of spring cleaning, and I will say that's about 80% of what I did at the brewery. Anyone who's involved with beer making or wine making knows that when it comes to fermentation, cleaning is 80 to 90% of the job, sanitation and cleaning. So um, here's a few exciting pictures of me cleaning. Um, <laughs> this is my best friend at the brewery. The first Japanese word I learned was mopu, mopu, mopu. Uh, mop, of course. and uh, I would uh, mop the entire floor around all the tanks. Uh, we would stir the tanks twice a day, and the floor, again, needed to be meticulously cleaned. Um, this was a task I will never forget. Uh, this is called the fukuro panchi, or fukuro punch. Fukuro means bag or sack. And this sack is actually used in one of the methods for pressing sake. Uh, I showed you the automatic press before, uh, but in this method, they take the moromi mash, they fill it into these individual bags, they lay them into a container, and they're pressed from above. When the pressing is done, the bags need to be turned inside out, and the kasu, that leftover lees, needs to be scraped out. After that, the bags need to be very meticulously cleaned multiple times. And what they asked me to do is to fill the bags halfway with water, twist the open end close, hold it like an accordion, and press vigorously with both hands. This would force the air and the water through the fabric and clean the very, very small particulate of any leftover mash. So on this particular day, I took a picture because they assigned me to do the entire batch of bags, which was 250 bags, in uh, one morning before lunch. And if, you, if you've gone through them once, uh, they actually require several rounds of this. So the Fukuro punch was something I will definitely never forget. And if you're feeling particularly uh, uh, angry at somebody, this is a really wonderful way to work out your aggressions. Um, the next thing I wanted to show you was uh, cleaning of the pumps. So another very practical thing that I didn't think about, when I was a sake teacher before this experience, I had all the textbook knowledge but none of the real background information. If you have 7,000 liters of sake mash, how actually do you get it from the tank into that press? Well, the answer is tubes and pumps, and cleaning the pumps was a, another thing that I had to do. And believe it or not, this sounds like hazing, but it wasn't. We actually used a toothbrush to clean these, so they had to be sanitized and cleaned, and every little bit of any chance of particulate being in there had to be cleaned out very meticulously. So this was something I spent a lot of time doing. Um, the next thing we did um, in this season was sansai foraging. So I actually was invited to go foraging for wild mountain vegetables. And the vegetable that I was hunting on this journey was called zenmai. It's like a large fiddlehead fern. And um, an older gentleman who works at the brewery took me on uh, this foraging run, and it's actually up the mountain. And I wanted to show you where I was climbing. So that's my guide. And you can't really see, so I wanted to highlight a few things. Um, I wanted to highlight the slope of this mountain. I was at points I was crawling on my hands and knees. And the trees were growing out at a 90 degree angle. It was really steep. We climbed up for 90 minutes, and this is what I was looking for. Um, so we would capture these, and we would put them in our backpack. And after 90 minutes, I kind of looked at my guide and I said, oh, that was a long climb. And he's like, oh, well, normally I go all the way to the top. It's another 90 minutes. But he took mercy on me and we took another 90 minutes and actually climbed back down. This type of uh, mountain vegetable is actually preserved. It takes a year 
to kind of pickle and preserve it. And then uh, I did not get a chance to eat any of the ones that I collected, but I will on my next trip to Japan. Um, and here is a, here's a look at some of the uh, mountain vegetables that we collected. So moving into summer, um, what do you do when the brewing winds up? Um, in the summer months, most breweries uh, cease their brewing, and it's the same at Hakkai-san. Um, one event that I had right at the beginning of the summer was an event called the Koshiki Taoshi, which kind of means like a steamer gets dumped over or tipped over, and we're going to clean out the steamer. So this is an event, a very formal event, that all the brewers come to. It's the day of the brewing season when we stop steaming rice. There's still sake brewing, we have tanks going, but there comes this day every season where we stop, we don't need any more rice because we're not creating any new tanks. And this is an event where all the brewers get dressed up in their suits. I actually didn't recognize any of my coworkers because they weren't wearing 100% of those white outfits. But uh, it's a very formal dinner and uh, the uh, president and the master brewer um, speak to all the brewers and thank them for their hard work and uh, it was a very uh, interesting to see this uh, event happening. The next place I worked after my work at the brewery was done was a uh, facility called the Yukimuro. This is the lobby of this building, and the Yukimuro is actually a snow storage cellar. And what do I mean by that? Well, this is actually inside the Yukimuro. This is a thousand tons of snow and it's a large insulated room. And on the other side of that uh, wall there, the, that uh, partition, there's 20 stainless steel sake tanks. And this sake is aged for three years using the cold from the snow alone. So there's no electricity used to chill these tanks. This is a way for Hakkai-san to make use of its natural resource, which is snow. So this room is insulated and it keeps the sake chilled between three and five degrees Celsius for the entire year. So I was working here in the height of the summer, so I love to go on the tours. They would take people through the Yukimuro and I would love to go on the tours because it was really, really cold in there. Um, anyway, one of the sakes we're gonna be enjoying tonight is actually our Yukimuro sake. So it's the sake that is um, chilled and aged for three years in this room. When I was working there, my job was to be at the uh, tasting table. So when guests come out of the tour of the snow storage cellar, they end up right in front of the tasting counter. And it was, my, it was more terrifying than climbing the mountain because I had to speak to the customers in Japanese. And um, uh, it was my job to explain all the different products that Hakkai-san was selling and to give people a taste. And I learned so much at this tasting bar. Um, the, the next thing we did in the summer, a lot of the brewers are full-time brewers, so to keep them busy over the summer, we actually make, Hakkai-san makes in-house homemade umeboshi, which are pickled plums. And I arrived at Hakkai-san not really understanding how to eat pickled plums. So the first day I went to the cafeteria, they gave me a pickled plum and some rice, and I put the whole thing in my mouth and chewed on it, and I said, why on earth would anyone want to eat this? Um, I realized later, after watching some of my coworkers, that you're supposed to eat little bits of this pickled plum with bites of rice, and eventually I discovered how to eat it properly, and it was absolutely delicious. So I told the brewers that when they make the next, next batch of pickled plums, I wanted to be involved in the process. So this is the arrival of the, the raw plums. Um, they are hard as a rock and green, so not, not at all what you would expect if you know what pickled plums look like. The first thing we did is we sat around and we picked out with a little wooden toothpick, we picked out all the stems of the pickled plums and washed them. And then we added salt and we put them in a container with a weight on top and packaged it up. So this was in June. And then we're gonna flash forward to July. And when we opened up the container, this is what we saw. So the salt had brought out a lot of moisture out of the pickled plums, but they were still green and yellow color. So how do we get them to be red like they're supposed to be? Well, the answer is uh, in July, we put in red shiso. So this is a red shiso leaf that we bought, and we mix it with salt, 
and we mash it and we mash it. We get as much moisture we, as we can out of the, uh, the uh, red shiso. And then that is added on a thick layer on top of the plums as they stand. And then that is packaged up and it's allowed to sit for another month. In August, at the hottest time of the year, this package is opened again and the pickled plums and the shiso are dried out over two to three days out in the August sun. And we would have to go out every few hours and turn each little plum by hand and they would develop a firm outer skin and then they were put back in the soaking liquid. And after that, they're pretty much done. They usually let this age for a year and um, this was a fantastic, wonderful experience making these pickled plums. And I really, really came to love the taste of these with the rice. Um, at the end of my time, uh, another really important event for me was my going away party. And I had a lot of, this was a magical night for sure. Um, first of all, um, this is Mr. Sano. He is the uh, director of the, he's the director of the uh, Shain Shokudo, which is the uh, employee cafeteria. And he would welcome me every day to the cafeteria. And he was always watching me very carefully because some things I liked and the few things they would serve were not my favorite. So he was always checking up on me to make sure I was getting enough to eat. And um, a few weeks before my going away party, he just casually asked me what were some of my favorite foods. And I said, well, you know, my favorite food in the whole world is chicken pot pie. And he's like, OK, OK. And he looked kind of quizzically. And then I show up to my going away party and he had made <laughs> individual chicken pot pies for everybody. So I got to see my entire uh, company for eat chicken pot pie for the first time, <laughs> which was my favorite food growing up. So that was really fun. And everyone dutifully came up to me and said how much they loved chicken pot pie. I, I don't know if it was true. Um, uh, this is Mr. Tanaka who is the assistant uh, toji or master brewer. Uh, this was the gentleman who was standing next to me when the rice slipped off the, uh, the scoop. And um, he was also the leader of the umeboshi making and he is presenting me with my own jar of homemade umeboshi to bring back to New York. And uh, that was very, very special to me. And lastly, this is Mr. Takao. And not only is Mr. Takao one of the most seasoned brewers at the brewery, but he is also a master carpenter. And he presented me with one of the shovels <laughs> that I used to scoop the rice, where the rice went flying off it. So um, he actually made me my own brewing implements, which was very, very, very sweet and very touching. And this was my final view, very similar to my arrival. It was almost the exact same day, and one year later, I headed out, and this is from the train, leaving Hakkai-san. So I wonder, did I achieve my goal after one year? So I want to look back at the goals I set for moving away from my friends and family, leaving New York, and going to rural Japan. Um, did I improve my knowledge of sake? Absolutely. I learned so many tricks and tips, and I feel it really empowered me as a sake educator to be knowledgeable and having been in the trenches and really knowing uh, the material inside and out. So that was a definite success. Did it improve my Japanese language skill? Well, not as much as I wanted. Um, I learned after I got there that a lot of brewing work is quite solitary. So when I was doing the Fukuro punch, for uh, four hours in the morning. There weren't a lot of people standing around chit-chatting with me. So I spent a lot of time working on solitary tasks or very concentrated on brewing tasks and there wasn't a lot of chit-chatting and I did live by myself in a small apartment. So I didn't get as much language practice as I wanted but that only gives me more reasons to go back to Japan in the future. And um, did I get to know the people behind the sake? Absolutely, yes. I developed so many wonderful relationships and um, it really makes me feel like an even better ambassador for the Hakkai-san brand, knowing all the personalities, all the nuance, and all the people that go into making the sake, and the company culture, I got to experience it firsthand. And uh, absolutely, I got to experience local culture. And I have a few uh, great stories to tell as well uh, based on that, and uh, I learned a lot about the food. So next, I wanted to 
introduce you to the sakes that we're going to be tasting tonight. So we have three uh, sakes that we're going to be enjoying uh, at a reception after uh, the tasting today. The one on the left is Hakkai-san Junmai Ginjo. Now on the tables, there's going to be little product cards and brochures, so you can get all these details um, at the table for the tasting. We're setting up one table for each of these sake so you can wander around the lobby area and try all three sakes. The one on the left is the Hakkai-san Junmai Ginjo. So this is the sake that changed my life. This is the very first sake I ever had back in 2005. And um, the taste of that sake is crisp, clean, and dry. I showed you the water source for Hakkai-san, and my nickname for this water, my nickname for this sake is actually magic water because it is clean, crisp, and it's like drinking from a magical mountain stream. Really delicious, crisp sake. Uh, the rice milling rate for that sake, we talked about rice milling, how much you polish away. Uh, the rice milling rate for that sake is actually 50% remaining. The sake in the middle in the brown bottle is Hakkai-san Tokubetsu Honjozo. So of all the sakes that Hakkai-san makes in Japan, the Honjozo is actually our best-selling sake. That has a rice milling rate of 55%. Uh, instead of being uh, extremely crisp and clean like the Junmai Ginjo, the Honjozo has a rounder taste and it has a, um, a very dry finish, but a, a little bit more rounded and uh, silky, not as crisp and very, very food friendly. Uh, if you try this sake um, uh, in restaurants, uh, it's wonderful to serve this sake warm as well as chilled. The sake on the right in the white bottle, as you may imagine, is our snow aged sake. This has a rice milling rate of uh, also of 50%, uh, and it is aged for three years in the snow storage facility that I showed you. So this sake is undiluted with water, which we call a Genshu style sake. And that gives it uh, much more weight and a little bit of a higher alcohol percentage. And it has a quite noticeable umami or savoriness. So this umami pairs beautifully with non-Japanese food. The sake is gonna be a little bit more weighty on the palate. That three years of aging really concentrates the flavors and gives you more weight and more uh, viscosity. So these are the three sakes that we're gonna be um, enjoying tonight. Um, if you'd like to learn more about Hakkai-san or about uh, my website, urbansake.com, these are all the contact details. And um, with that, I'd like to thank you so much for uh, coming out tonight. Yeah. So we're, we're going to be doing a Q&A. Uh, we have a few minutes before our reception starts. So if anybody has any questions about Japanese sake or living in Japan or anything um, related to the lecture, uh, please raise your hand and we'll get a microphone uh, passed over to you. So uh, who has a question for us? How about down here in the front? Yeah. I was in Japan for the first time in November and I was expecting that there might be sake bars the way there are wine bars here. But that didn't seem to be the case. It seemed that younger people were more into the, the mixology world, that sake seemed to be their parents' drink, that you really had to go to a restaurant and eat in order to sample through any sakes. Is that true, or is that just my impression? No, I, th I think you described the situation very well. Um, Sake is uh, not the most popular alcohol in Japan. Beer is the number one most popular alcohol. And cocktails are becoming very popular with young people. So sake has a real challenge. What I think you're picking up on is the fact that um, in Japan, sake is almost always paired with food. So even if you go to a place that bills itself strictly as a bar where there's no kitchen serving warm food, you will always get some type of food or bites. It's called otsumami, a little appetizer that goes with the sake. So from a Japanese point of view, from the Japanese brewer's point of view, sake is always going to be consumed with food. So it's very true that when you go to Japan, the most common place where you will find it is in a setting with food. So that is very true. So who's next? How about uh, right here? Yeah. 
speak to the rice milling um, numbers that you were talking about, like 50% rice milling, 55%? Yeah. Like, is that what does that mean, and why do we care about it? Sure. Chusaki. The rice milling is called semai buai, the rice milling percentage, how much you leave remaining in the grain. If you mill the rice grain just a little bit, there will be lots of, uh, as I mentioned before, the starches in the center of the grain and the fats and proteins are on the outside. Fats and proteins are what give rice a ricey taste. And if you mill all of those away and you're just left with pure starch, you can coax other flavors out of sake, like fruity flavors or melon flavors or creamy uh, uh, lactic flavors. Uh, but if there's lots of rice left on the grain, you're going to get a ricey tasting sake. If you've had sake before and it tasted like steamed rice or very ricey flavored, that's a good indication that that milling rate was not very low but more robust. If you've had a sake that is very elegant, silky, and tastes like melon or strawberry, chances are that a lot of those outer layers were milled away and you had a very small milling rate. So the milling has a big impact on the flavor of the sake uh, and the weight, the perceived weight of the taste of the sake. And the milling rate also has a very direct impact on the cost of the sake. Uh, it's true, if, if, you mill, if you decide to make a sake with a 40% milling rate, 60% of each grain is milled away and it's rice powder, you know, it's not being used then that's a big cost towards making that sake. So there's a, a flavor impact and there's also a big cost impact to that rice milling rate. So it's something you want to pay attention to. How about in the back, right there in the middle? Yep. Yeah. Oh, can you wait for a microphone? You were talking about some of the off flavors for sake that can develop uh, due to lack of cleaning. Yeah. Uh, what are some of those off flavors that you find? Mm. Like, how do you taste that? Well, it's like smelling a rotten egg. You know it when it's there. Okay. <laughs> um, there, there it, it's a fine line. You know, there's between fermentation and spoilage is a very fine line. And the Japanese eat some, foods, eat some foods like natto and other fermented foods that are hard for Westerners to palate, but they love the smell and they love the taste. So, um, so it's a fine line between what is an off flavor in sake, but I find that if it's pleasing to you and you enjoy it, then you can look for it. But when a sake has truly spoiled, you're going to have noticeable off flavors. Um, if you're not very, very... Um, careful with the cleaning, you can have a, a slight impact on the flavor of the sake. Uh, so you really have to be meticulous with the sanitation that's used to get the flavor that the brewer intended. So that's why so much of the work is cleaning and sanitizing. Yeah, Back there. <clears throat> um. Is there a reason why they showed a picture, uh, why you showed a picture of like the cracked rice versus the uncracked on how it's cold? Yeah. And also um, <clears throat> the thing that you scraped off uh, after you press it, mm -hmm. is there anything that's done with the byproduct? Oh yeah, that's a great question. So the, the cracked rice versus the whole rice, that was just an example that the, uh, it was like a lesson that the uh, manager of that facility was showing me that when you uh, take the rice out of the milling machine, um, you can't let it chill too quickly, so we can't put it in a cold area. You need to let the rice rest in a room temperature area for quite a while so that the fragile grains don't crack. That's something you want to avoid. Um, and the kasu, the sake kasu, the leftover pressing, is an integral part of Japanese cooking. It's used in many different types of food preparation in Japan. Um, there's uh, pickles that are made by burying vegetables in that sake kasu. I've also seen preparations of whole fish where, they, again, they bury the fish under the sake kasu and they bake it. And I've seen it used as uh, like miso in miso soup, but they use that sake kasu instead of miso to make a very delicious soup, stews and hot pots and things like that. So the, um, the uh, sake kasu is used in a lot of cooking and it can be really, really delicious and add a sake flavor to many different dishes. Yes. How about here? Yeah. We're going to get you a microphone. I'm just curious about the uh, acidity levels in uh, sake as compared to the acidity levels in, say, white and red wines. Yeah. 
That's another great question. Uh, sake has about one third the acidity of wine. So the, uh, the acid levels are much, much lower than you're going to get with wine. And uh, I've met, uh, I've often taught wine sommeliers in my sake classes, and some of them are big fans of high acid wines, and they take their first sip of sake and they're like, oh, tastes like water, it tastes like nothing, there's no acid, there's no backbone. But sake has a secret weapon that wine does not have. Uh, the acidity is much, much lower. But the secret weapon of sake is that sake has seven to ten times the amino acid profile of wine. Now, what is amino acid? Amino acid is the building blocks of protein, and protein gives us the sense of umami. You're all familiar with this term, umami? Umami is the savory deliciousness that you find in many Japanese foods, um, shiitake mushroom, sashimi, and also Western foods like Parmesan cheese are very rich in these amino acids that give you that savory deliciousness. So that is why sake pairs so beautifully with Japanese food because umami is the base of Japanese cooking with adashi and seaweed products and fish products. Um, there are some wine pairings that are quite difficult for sommeliers, like bitter green vegetables is a great example. Like asparagus is a notoriously difficult wine pairing, and asparagus and sake pair with absolutely no problem. So if you look for the savory notes, uh, the umami notes across all different cuisines, it's very easy to find happy sake and food pairings. So that's kind of the secret, secret weapon that sake has, even though it does lack some of the acidity that wine has. Uh, how about over here? Yeah. Hi. Uh, what are the most common agings of sake? So let's say single malts have 12, 15, 18 years. <coughs> well, how about sake? Yeah. The majority of sake is meant to be consumed relatively young. So I would say at our, at our brewery, the vast majority of our sakes were aged for six months. And this was just what we would call a settling down period to let the sake uh, settle and allow us to mix the different tanks and create the flavor we wanted. There's some sakes that are not aged at all, that are shipped as fresh pressed sake. Those are very brash, green, and uh, zippy. Uh, the standard aging period is about six months. And if you age for over three years, you get into an area like our snow aged sake that is technically called a koshu, or an aged, I call it an aged on purpose sake, uh, aged for three years or more. And when you age sake, a big decision you have to make when you do that is what temperature you're going to age at. If you age at a very low temperature like we do in our snow storage facility, you're going to see when you try the snow sake, it is very, very clear and did not change in color much at all. If you age a sake at room temperature, you're going to get a darkening of the color, that's the concentration of the sugars. And if you, uh, if you age at room temperature, you're going to have a lot more of that color change. So when you look for an aged sake, it's really only about 1% or 2% of the whole sake market would be aged for that long. It's really a niche product, but temperature plays a big role when you talk about those longer aging times. Yes, how about right here? After you open a bottle of sake, how do you store it and how long can you keep it? I love this question. Um, <clears throat> so when you open a bottle of sake, there's really two sides to this question. Like how long do you have before you open it and how long after you open it? Generally, sake is meant to be consumed within one year of the date on the label. And if you find a date on the label, that is uh, generally the bottling date of the sake. So the rule of thumb is generally within one year you want to drink the sake. So um, it's not meant to be aged um, outside of the brewery for long periods of time. And uh, brewers really want you to enjoy the sake fresh and as young as possible. Once you've opened the bottle, a lot of people think that sake will deteriorate on the same scale as wine, but actually I'm happy to be here to tell you that uh, sake lasts for two to three weeks or more once the bottle is open. Um, I've never tested this in my own house because the sake tends to disappear before the three weeks are up. Every time I've tried this experiment, 
but uh, sake is much more robust in the bottle after you've opened it. Uh, you can use those oxygen extractors or uh, infused gas if you want to get fancy about preserving the taste of your sake, but I've had sake that's been open for two, three, four weeks or longer. As long as it's kept sealed and kept in the fridge in a dark place, um, you are good to go and chances are very high that your sake will last a long time. The more fragrant and fruity and more elegant the sake is, the, the more likely it is to kind of diminish in taste a little faster, but the more earthy, ricey, full-bodied sakes have a, have a really good shelf life once they're open. Yes, in the back corner there, yep. <clears throat> Yes, that gentleman right there, thank you. Given the artisanal nature of what's created uh, and the obvious demand which follows because of it, I'm wondering uh, whether we're going to see even more automation in the, the way mm. parts of this are done to try and get the quantities up, to keep the costs in control, and to reach to other markets. Yes, that's a great question as well. Um, there are breweries right now in Japan that make sake on a very, very large scale. They use lots of automation. And there are sake making machines where you put water and rice in one end and sake comes out the other. There's very little human intervention. Uh, those sakes tend to be mass market, what we would call table sake, or uh, non-premium sake. And that's about 70% or 75% of the market in Japan is this mass made uh, non-premium sake. The question about how to integrate uh, machines and automation into the premium sake market is a very interesting question. And I can share with you the philosophy that we had at Hakkai-san. Uh, that was to automate and mechanize those steps that were better done and produced a better result with a machine versus a human. And any step that a human could do better than a machine was going to remain with a human. And I'll give you a good example of that. I showed you a picture of me washing rice by hand. That was actually for a sample batch of rice. And uh, we do that every day to test the uh, atmospheric conditions and the humidity. And we want to get the uh, moisture soaking into the rice, the amount that's going to happen day by day very precisely. But the majority of the rice washing is done by a machine that is very, very precise. And it washes the rice exactly the same for every batch. And when a human tries to do that exactly the same for every batch, you just can't get the same percentage of absorption for every single batch. So that is one case where a machine does it better. However, um, when we're making koji, that molded rice, there are machines that do that. But 100% of the koji rice that we make at Hakkai-san is done by hand. And that is a very, very laborious, labor-intensive production. And that accounts for a big chunk of the manpower needs at Hakkai-san. So that is something that we will not give over to machines because humans can do it better and more precisely. So it's a marriage right now, I think, of what, what can be um, uh, given the machine treatment and what can be done by humans based on the quality of what comes out. Yes, how about right here? How is the post-Fukushima world that we live in now impacted Hakkai-san's quality control? Um, well, Hakkai-san is located in Niigata, which is a different prefecture from Fukushima. Um, but I think that um, that uh, incident has raised awareness across all industries, not just sake making, that you know, quality control is really important. And um, uh, there's all types of testing and quality assurance that is done. I didn't show in the slideshow, but I did several days working in the laboratory where they would test a sample from every single batch every single day. And uh, so there are these um, uh, great amount of uh, research that's done for uh, testing all the sake. So it's very, very thorough. And I think in Japan, when you're producing any type of consumable product, especially after 2011, that that's definitely taken more prominence. Yes, how about right here in front? We're going to get you a microphone. I was curious if you could explain the implications of filtered versus unfiltered sake. Mm, another one of my favorite questions. So um, the question of uh, filtering, uh, there's, there's a little bit of wordplay going on here, filtered versus unfiltered. When most people think of un, what, what is commonly called unfiltered sake, that is a cloudy type of, have you seen it? It's a cloudy type of sake that's kind of milky white in color. 
Um, actually, according to the law, sake that is cloudy or clear both have to pass through a filter. So calling it unfiltered is a little bit of a misnomer. So I like to refer to it as cloudy or clear sake. Cloudy sake is sake that's gone through a filter but a very coarse filter. And little bits of rice starch from the mash get into the final product and make it cloudy and give you that texture. Clear sake uses a very, very fine filter and removes all sediment and you get a clear product. So the difference between cloudy and clear is based on how it's pressed. The taste difference, uh, cloudy sake, it's called nigori in Japanese. Nigori kind of means murky. Um, so this uh, cloudy style sake has lots of residual rice starch in there. And when that rice starch hits your tongue, it converts right away into glucose. So a lot of people refer to this cloudy style of sake as a sweeter style. And um, uh, that, that gives you a little bit more of a sweeter impression. The clear sake can have a wide range of taste, but it doesn't have that texture or that residual starch that's in there. So that's kind of the primary difference. I've seen cloudy sake be very, very, nigori sake has been very popular outside of Japan. And um, uh, it's, it's, uh, I think it's a little less esteemed in Japan uh, because there's a, a preference for something that is fully filtered and very clear. And uh, many people enjoy the cloudy style here. It all comes down to your personal preference. Yes, how about right here? <clears throat> uh, packaging. Uh, in Japan, you see those barrels of sake. Tell yeah. me about those. How well, do you use them? <laughs> well, the, the large, you mean the large barrels with the writing on them? Yes, at temples, yeah. So um, the large barrels that you see displayed at temples in Japan, that's called a taru, T-A-R-U, a taru. And before uh, modern bottling was invented, sake was actually shipped in cedar wooden barrels. And they would wrap them with rice straw wrapping and put their logo on the front. So this, in modern day, this became a kind of a symbol of uh, sake brewery. And when a sake brewery donates sake to a temple, the temple will display their barrel outside the temple. Now, the sake is not actually in there for people to go drink, but it's a symbol of their sake being donated for use at the temple. So we're uh, getting close to our, our uh, reception time, so I'll take one more question. How about right here? Hi. <clears throat> a friend of mine used to brew his own beer, but felt his landlord would not be very understanding about sake. However, he reported to me that when it's brewed, there's a bizarre technicolor aspect to the mash. Is that so? Turns all kind of, he, said, he, said, he said he was afraid to do it at home because he thought it was going to turn all kinds of colors, and his <laughs> landlord would walk in and assume that he was just doing you know homemade nukes or something. Well... <laughs> That's a new one for me. I've never heard that before. Um, uh, when we brewed sake at the brewery, the mash was always one color throughout the whole, whole season. It's like an off-white, kind of looks like French vanilla melted ice cream. That's kind of the color of the sake mash. I've never seen it change other colors. I'll um, warn him. OK. <laughs> Great. So uh, we're going to be moving on to our reception. I'll be available in the reception for any additional questions that you have. And thank you once again for coming to our lecture. Thank you.